Chapter Three of the Adventures of a Nature Guide by Enos Mills. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It has been said of Louis Agassiz in his later American travels he would talk of glacial phenomena to the driver of a country stagecoach among the mountains, or to some workman splitting rock at the roadside, with as much earnestness as if he had been discussing problems with a brother geologist he would take the common fisherman into his scientific confidence telling him the intimate secrets of fish structure or fish embryology till the man in his turn became enthusiastic and began to pour out information from the stores of his own rough and untaught habits of observation agassiz's general faith in the susceptibility of the popular intelligence however untrained to the highest truths of nature was contagious and he created or developed that in which he believed chapter three winter mountaineering after a heavy snowfall one december morning i started on skis for two weeks camping in the colorado rockies the fluffy snow lay smooth and unbroken over the broken mountains. Here and there, black pine and spruce trees uplifted arrowheads and snow cones of the white mantle. On the steep slope, half a mile from my cabin, I was knocked to one side by a barrel mass of snow dropping upon me from a tree, and one ski escaped. As if glad to be off on an adventure of its own, it sped down the mountainside like a shot it bumped into a low stump skied high into the air and over a treetop and then fell undamaged in the deep snow recovering my runaway ski i started for the summit of the range a distance of about nine miles from my cabin for an hour i followed a stream whose swift waters now and then splashed up through the broken icy skylights then leaving the canyon and skirting the slope i was on the plateau summit of the continental divide twelve thousand feet above the sea the summit moor was deeply overlaid with undrifted snow southward it extended mile after mile rising higher and higher into the sky in broken snow-covered peaks to the north the few small broken cliffs and low buttes emphasized the trackless solitude this plateau or moorland was less than one mile wide and comparatively smooth its edges descended precipitously two thousand feet into cirques and canyons southward i traveled along the nearly level expanse of undrifted snow looking back along the line of my ski tracks i saw a mountain lion leisurely cross from east to west apparently she had come up out of the woods for mad play and slaughter among the unfortunate snowbound folk of the summit she stopped at my tracks for an interested look turned her head and glanced back along the way i had come then her eyes appeared to follow my tracks to the boulder pile from behind which I was then looking playfully bouncing off the snow she struck into my ski prints with one forepaw lightly as a kitten then she dived into them pretended to pick up something between her forepaws reared and with a swing tossed it into the air then her playful mood changed and she started on across the divide after several steps she stopped looking back as if she had forgotten something but was a little too lazy to retrace her steps but finally she came back she walked along my ski tracks for a few steps then began to romp now and then making a great leap forward and rolled and struck about with the pretense of worrying something she had captured she repeated this pantomime a few times and then as if suddenly remembering her original plan of action again walked westward arriving at the summit she hesitated and when i saw her last 
she was calmly surveying the scenes far below on the mountain skyline i crossed a white tundra half expecting to see an eskimo peer from a snow mound arctic plants buried in the snow and ptarmigan eskimo chickens in their snow-white dress were the only signs of life later in the day i saw a white weasel slipping over the snow toward a number of the ptarmigan often on the summits the ptarmigan in leggings and coats of pure white watched me and allowed me to come and remain near they like the snowshoe rabbit skimmed over the surface on home-grown snowshoes possibly from them the eskimos got the idea of the webbed snowshoe which they have used for ages more than once when weathering gales where the thick insistent snow dust made me acquainted with the unpleasant sensations of strangulation i have envied the rosy finch and other birds of the snow who have a well-developed screen to keep choking snow dust out of the nostrils the eskimos also have a slotted wooden shield to protect the eye from the burning glare of reflected sunlight i descended a few hundred feet into the upper edge of the woods to find shelter for the night clearing out the snow between a cliff and a rock about six feet from it i had an excellent lodging place i built a roaring fire and heated a number of stones when this space was warmed i pushed the fire and the heated stones along the open space between the rock and the cliff then i started a fire against the base of the detached rock two huge sticks were placed at the bottom of this fire pile over these smaller ones were laid and at the top still smaller ones i set fire to this on the top so that it would burn slowly and not be at its hottest for an hour or two within the circle of warmth i placed my elk skin sleeping bag crawled into it and slept for nearly four hours when the cold awakened me i renewed both fires then had another short sleep when i again awoke i was ready for another day's adventure i set off through a forested slope that tilted gently toward the sun black shadows long and straight lay upon the forest floor the crowded pines were slender and limbless except at the top across an opening these slender shadows were at their best with the snow glistening in white lines between their deep black ones after two hours i came out upon a white and treeless meadow across which shadows were flying moving cloud shadows rushed across and the shadow of a soaring eagle appeared swiftly skating in circles over the snow i spent hours reading the news observing the illustrations and studying the hieroglyphics on the snow whether footprints in the mud or snow may have suggested printing cannot be told but it is certain that the tracks stains and impressions in snow print the news and record the local animal doings here the rabbits played there the grouse searched for dinner while over yonder the long lacy trail of a mouse ends significantly between the impressions of two wing feathers one sees a trail made by a long-legged animal and another by a fellow with a long body and short legs perhaps a weasel at one place near the foot of an old tree a squirrel had abandoned a cone and run home nearby was the trail of a porcupine who was well fed well protected and though dull-witted not at all afraid apparently he hadn't any idea where he was going and did not care whom he should meet for at one place he came face to face with a fox and the fox turned aside footprints often reveal the excitement hesitation change of plan and the preparation of two wild folks advancing and about to meet most animals except the grizzly 
though concerned with sight and scent, appear not to consider the impressions in the tell-tale snow. I passed again through woods, where, the previous winter, I had walked upon ten feet of snow. In that trip I had looked down upon a camp bird, cuddled in an old nest. I talked to her for a minute, and, as is common with her kind, she came close, seeking something to eat. Three eggs were in the nest, though it was February. Never before had I found a bird nesting in the famine month of the year. These eggs may not have hatched, but another time I saw a nest of this species in March with eggs that did hatch. April is the nesting time for this bird. Why a pair sometimes nest unusually early is their secret. I found the crested jay that flings forth its jarring note as harsh and cold as frosty steel, using these mountains for winter quarters. A few of this species remain for the summer, but the majority nest further north. The water ouzel is a winter songster, and twice during this outing, in a snow-filled canyon, he sang to me cheerily. He may be seen and heard in any month of the year. This bird of quiet, cheering presence is an outdoor enthusiast. He was always delightfully busy and indifferent to my close approach if I came quietly and slowly. The scarlet berries and small shining green leaves of the kinnikinick gave color and charm to many snowy places. Half buried in the snow, in the sun or shadow, in niches of crags, or as wreath-like coverings for the rocks, they were bright and cheerful everywhere. I can imagine that the winter birds and animals worship the Chinook wind. One evening I went to sleep shivering. I was awakened through being too warm and leaped out of my sleeping bag, thinking it must be on fire. Then I discovered that in the night a Chinook had come. This warm, dry wind occasionally follows a blizzard and often it appears to make a sudden and triumphant attack upon a cold period. During the short day or two that it dominates, it is a blessing. It often raises the temperature thirty or more degrees in a few hours. On another cold, windy night, I had a poor camp and damp clothes. I had examined the ice around a beaver house to see if it was built by a spring it was and i had broken through the thin ice that night as i shivered by a slow fire i wished that i might have occupied a woodpecker's house i took comfort in the fact that at no time during the trip would i be annoyed by flies and mosquitoes from the sheltering edge of the woods i watched the high wind stir and sweep the excited snow the snowflakes had long since been reduced to powder and dust by colliding with cliffs and by being thrown violently against the earth. The wind was intermittent. A wave of snow dust swept along the snow-crusted earth, filling the air. Then a few seconds of sunshine played before the next wave followed. Occasionally everything cleared and stopped for an exhibit of the whirlwind. A towering white column of snow dust would spin across the scene. This commonly was followed by another and heavier spiral that was more like a confusion of white whirled clouds. All this time the sun was shining in a blue sky, and all this time, too, a sparkling pennant of diamond snow dust and powder a mile long was fluttering from the tip of a triangular peak. With such scenes in mind, the trees abloom with flakes, the white and sparkling whirlwinds, the vast and scintillating snow powder pennants, I could understand the poetic fancy of primitive people who happily named winter's gifts snow flowers and who honored the snow period with an outdoor celebration. After all, winter is but a transient return of the ice age 
with fresh falls on the heights above timberline before the wind blows the vast world appears overlaid with a permanent stratum of snow across white distances one looks for miles without seeing a tree or any living object or even a shadow unless it be that of a passing cloud though the high mountains have their snowstorms and their eternal snowfields in most mountain ranges the snowfall on the middle slopes of the mountains is heavier than upon the high plateaus and summits on the heights the wind has free play and sweeps most of the snow into enormous piles or drifts these are one hundred or more feet deep and sometimes cover nearly a square mile owing to their depth the low temperature of the heights and the fact that they are so densely packed these snow masses endure throughout the year wind is thus chiefly the factor in the making of snow topography small hills and plains canyons plateaus and mountain ranges all of snow are a constant source of interest one morning i awoke with dense white storm clouds all around me and the snow coming down wishing to camp that night at timberline i traveled up the mountainside in the thickly falling snow and dense clouds these clouds were drifting easily along the mountainside and together with the feathery flakes which they were shedding made it impossible to see distinctly even to the end of an extended arm suddenly i became aware of a diminished depth of snow underfoot i stooped to measure it it was less than three inches on rising i thrust my head through the silver lining the upper surface of the cloud into the sunshine the altitude was about eleven thousand feet above and about me the peaks and plateaus stood in gray and brown not a flake of all this snow had fallen upon them there was nothing to indicate that a storm had prevailed just below during the last two days and nights or that only a step down the mountain snow was still falling soundless and motionless the cloud sea lay below here and there an upthrusting pinnacle cast a shadow upon it unable to make myself believe that below me the flakes were falling thick and fast and that the ground was deeply covered with soft white snow i plunged down into the cloud after enjoying the novelty for a few minutes i climbed out of the snowstorm again and then once more descended into it as the mountainside was comparatively unbroken i walked along the upper edge of the cloud for some distance two or three times this fluffy mass swelled and rose slightly above me and then settled easily back in the head of a gulch cloud swells rose slightly higher than out in the main sea i climbed down into them a short distance thinking to cross the hidden canyon but finding it too steep walled climbed out again as i emerged from the gulch i saw nearby a huge grizzly bear sunning himself on a cliff that rose a few feet out of the cloud into the sunshine he like myself appeared greatly interested in the slow rise and fall and ragged outline of the storm cloud he was all attention to every new movement near him on scenting me he stared for a moment as if thinking where on earth did he come from then he stepped overboard into the clouds i camped that night beside a clump of storm-battered trees that marked the upper limit of the forest in the morning all was clear the cloud sea of the day before had rolled silently away along the mountainside the ragged edge of snow stretched for miles above it barren rocky peaks rose in a great mountain desert below all was soft and white a wonderful world of mountains made of snowflakes near my camp was an ancient-looking tree clump 
none of the trees was taller than my head and though of almost normal form they were somewhat gnarled and appeared as old as the hills centuries they surely had seen trees on the forest outpost in high mountains endure severe trials they are dwarfed battered and broken huddled behind boulders buried or half buried in snow the forest frontier is maintained by these brave tree people seen again and again this region displays features of new interest as often as the visitor returns to it on the heights i frequently saw conies one day i lingered to watch one that was less shy than the majority he sat with his back against the sunny side of a boulder looking serious and keeping a careful survey of his field of vision presently i discovered his haystack his supply of winter food a tiny heap of grass sedge and alpine plants it was about two feet high and was sheltered beneath two half-arching stones many were the ways in which i found animals spending the winter in the course of this outing i saw several flocks of mountain sheep all these were in the heights above the tree line on the day following the snow drifting one i crossed the heights and on the summit passed close to a flock they were feeding in a space that the wind had swept bare of snow happy highlanders they were well fed and contented in their home twelve thousand feet above the tides one sunny though cold morning i came upon a large dead tree in it were a number of woodpecker holes wondering if these houses had winter dwellers i struck the tree with my hatchet instantly a dozen or more chickadees came pouring out of one of the holes like so many merry children from a hole in the opposite side of the tree flew one or more birds that i did not see out of one of the upper holes a downy woodpecker thrust his head glaring down at me with one eye impatient as late sleepers usually are when called he appeared to be wanting to say why am i disturbed this is a cold morning there are no early worms to be had in winter from another hole flew another downy i felt sure that none of these late sleepers had breakfasted seldom is an old woodpecker house without a tenant bluebirds wrens and numbers of weak billed folk nest in them during the summer while birds of other species find them life-savers in the winter a hummingbird's nest that i found brought to mind the fact that its builder if alive was then among the tropical flowers of central america later in the day i saw a flock of chickadees one or two brown creepers and a solitary woodpecker food hunting together the chickadees kept up a cheering conversation and twice i thought i heard the woodpecker give a call I wondered if these fellow food hunters also all lodged in one many-roomed apartment house. Coming one day to a beaver pond, I scraped off the snow and looked through the clear ice into the water. Two or three beavers were swimming. The water between the ice and the bottom of the pond was about two feet deep. Each autumn the beavers pile ample winter supplies in deep water close to the house. The pond may freeze over, but this ice covering is a protection. The house entrance is on the bottom of the pond, beneath the ice, and the floor is above the level of the pond. The water in the lower part of the house does not freeze. The beaver residents were here having a comfortable time, while deer in nearby woods were floundering in the snow. I have known deer to have a hard time of it in winter commonly deer winter in lower altitudes but sometimes they stay in the middle mountain region and worry through the snowy weeks by yarding that is a number remaining in one small area where through daily trampling they keep on top of the snow and still find enough to eat a number of animals hibernate 
fat woodchucks live in a den five or six feet below the surface storms may come and go but the woodchuck sleeps till the first flowers wake the grizzly and the black bear spend from three to five months in heavy hibernating sleep plants too though anchored have a variety of winter customs trees may be said to hibernate even the firs and spruces that go to sleep in full dress beneath the snow are countless seeds that will live their life next year and numbers of plants that have hauled down their towers and colors for the winter you may seek them and walk over them and mother nature will only say trouble me not for the door is now shut and my children are with me in bed moss in midwinter is as fresh and charming as though knee-deep in june it is dainty and striking in a white setting mosses and lichens are ever a part of the poetry associated with ferns and the golden sands of bubbling springs they are sharers in the cheerful ever silent beauty of the wild they never intrude but are among the most subdued and harmonious decorations in all nature yet lichens carry all the colors of the rainbow in dark woods deep canyons and on the pinnacles of high peaks they cling in leafy map-like decorations of oxidized silver hammered brass pure copper and stains of yellow brown scarlet gray and green they are almost classical decorations and touch with soft color and beauty the roughest bark and boulders until one knows that they are living things they seem only chemical colorings of the crags and a part of the color scheme in the bark of trees one day during this outing i had been walking in the shadow of a mountain which together with the darkness of the spruce woods made the snow almost a gray expanse as i climbed out of the shadow onto a plateau just at sunset how splendidly dazzlingly white was the skyline of peaks on this white and broken line the sunset colored clouds strangely rested a sunset is never an old story and a colored sunset above the white west line of winter's silent earth renews the imagination of youth though i crossed a number of alpine lakes they were not to be seen they were gone from the landscape a stratum of marble instead of snow could not better have concealed them lakes flowers and bears were asleep for the winter in snowless places the brooks had decorated their ways with beautiful ice structures arches and arcades spires and frozen splashes and endless stretches and forms of silver streamside platings and boulder drapings ice crystal clear frosted and opaque many rocks were overspread with ice sheets and icy drapery and cliffs were decked with fretwork and stupendous icicles smaller streams froze to the bottom overflowed and outbuilt in places wide areas were covered to enormous depths looking upon these one might almost fancy the ice age returning but three months later the ice was gone to the far-off sea and the flowers that slept beneath were massing their brilliant blossoms in the sun an old ute chief once told me that during the hardest winter he had ever known in his country the snow for weeks lay six ponies deep the average annual snowfall in the rocky mountains is less than twenty-five feet this is less than the average for the alps meetings with other human beings were few one day while walking down a plateau i saw a dark figure that stood waiting on the edge of a snowy mountain moor a mile distant as i approached the man waved an arm to attract my attention and when i came near enough he said by way of greeting i thought you had not seen me we were above the limits of tree growth and below and about us was a wild array of peaks and canyons 
when i saw you coming racing down that peak shoulder said the man i fancied that you were an escaping siberian convict sentenced for political aims what is your sentence or your service they call me the snowman i replied i am making winter experiments and gathering information along the summit of the continental divide i had not as yet become official colorado snow observer in answer to a counter question of mine he said oh i'm a prospector fifty-four born in ireland raised in australia and siberia am after gold in spruce gulch if i don't strike it by spring i'm off for alaska stirring reports from there it was a good place to look around several towering peaks were strangely near a number of summits reached up fourteen thousand feet into the blue sky colorado is crowded with a vast and wondrous array of mountains many of these are united by narrow plateaus that are savagely side-cut with deep canyons each time i gained a commanding height i looked again and again awed by the immensity of it all at peaks and canyons with their broken strata of snow the outing as usual was all too short ten of its fourteen days were sunny and calm through two days the wind roared two other days were filled with snowstorms each day i went to some new scene i climbed one fourteen thousand foot peak i occupied one camp three nights but on each of the other nights i had a new camp most of the nights were filled with stars and always there was a blazing campfire on my way home i met a man who had heard of my winter camping habits after questioning me concerning the objects of interest seen he asked is this a good time of year for a vacation i replied a good time for a vacation is whenever you can spare the time and the very best time for a vacation in the mountains is when you can stay the longest end of chapter three chapter four of the adventures of a nature guide by enos mills this librivox recording is in the public domain poor naked wretches wheresoe'er you are that bide the pelting of this pitiless storm how shall your houseless heads and unfed sides your looped and windowed raggedness defend you from seasons such as these shakespeare chapter four trees at timberline all day i followed the dwarfed battered uppermost edge of the forest through the heights of the rockies my barometer steadily said that we were two miles higher than the sea from a stand of dead timber i cut eleven small trees and carried them in one load to my campfire they were so gnarled and ancient looking that they aroused my curiosity and with a magnifier i counted the annual rings in each the youngest was one hundred forty six years of age and the oldest two hundred and fifty eight the total age of these eleven trees was two thousand one hundred ninety one years these and other trees had blazed in my fire and fallen to ashes long before i fell to sleep beneath the low and crowded stars with rare exceptions the trees at timberline are undersized and of imperfect form a forest only eight feet high is not uncommon one winter a tough staff that i used was almost an entire tree which had been nearly four hundred years in growing a tree that i carried home in my pocket the microscope showed to be more than three score and ten years old annual rings in many of these timberline trees are scarcely one one hundredth of an inch in diameter while a fate favored cottonwood or eucalyptus may in one season envelop itself with a ring that is more than an inch in diameter 
the age of a timberline tree cannot be approximated by its size or appearance or by the size or the age of its neighbors it may have lived twice as long and it may have endured more hardships than its nearby fellows of similar size and appearance environment has shaped many timberline trees into huge and crooked vines still others are picturesque bell-shaped individuals formed by the deeply drifting snows pressing the limbs downward and against the trunk during the summer months the limbs partly regain their natural position and the result is a slender bell shape in tall trees and a heavy bell outline in stocky ones instead of a symmetrical limb development many trees are one-sided imagine a tree with storm threshed limbs all flung out on one side of the trunk like a tattered wind-blown banner then imagine thousands of bannered trees scattered and grouped in a mountainside forest front the climatic conditions at the forest frontier are trying but timberline trees are hardy and probably have as long or even longer lives than the majority of their more fortunately placed relatives the oldest timberline settler that i ever studied had been permanently located at an altitude of eleven thousand four hundred thirty seven feet for one thousand one hundred eighty two years when finally killed by fire much branched and stocky its height was twelve feet and its diameter a foot above the earth was four feet six inches what these timberline trees lack in symmetry and heroic size they make up in hardiness and aggressiveness timberland in the far northland marks the latitudinal limits while the mountain timberline shows the altitudinal limits of the forest life zone the forest furthest north ends in a ragged battered edge against the arctic prairies the polar storms that sweep across the broken ice fields and barren lands meet with first resistance in the advanced low crouching timberline of sturdy spruces timberline far up the sides of high mountains is as strange and as abrupt a boundary as the crooked and irregular shoreline of the sea this mountainside timberline is the forest's uppermost edge above are the treeless distances and barren heights of the arctic alpine zone below and away from the ragged edge drapes and rolls the dark and broken robe of forest like old ocean's shifting and disputed boundary line timberline is a place where contending forces ever surge and roar nowhere does this forest frontier the ever contending line of battle between woods and weather appear more stormy or striking than in the high mountains of the west for miles this timberline extends away in a front of dwarfed and distorted trees millions of them ever fiercely fighting a relentless enemy the veterans show the intense severity of the struggle as they stand resolutely in their inhospitable heights timberline trees are among the distinct attractions of our national parks timberline is probably the most telling in the rocky mountain national park but in the yosemite mount rainier and glacier national parks it has striking phases it is an illustrated and graphic story one of the most powerful in the book of nature in colorado this mountainside tree line is two vertical miles above the shoreline of the sea like the ocean's edge timberline has miles that are straight and level as a die but in places it sweeps outward around a peninsula and follows the crooked line of an invading canyon there are forested bays beautiful coves and wooded islands stretches of forest climb high ridges and invading outposts
make a successful stand in favorable spots among the snowfields far above the main forest front violent dry winds that blow ever from the same quarter are a powerful relentless foe of many a forest frontier they either point all limbs toward the leeward or prevent all limbs except leeward ones from growing trees are pushed out of plum and entire forests are pushed partly over then overweighted with snow they are forced down to earth and flattened out the wind and snow never allow them to rise again and they become in effect huge vines or low long-bodied prehistoric animals headed to the leeward they refuse to die and many live on for centuries snow cold and dryness are the chief factors which determine whether the forest may or shall not grow in some localities the snow line is the barrier that forms the timber line dryness of locality combined with dry winds resists forestation but the sand blasts of dry windy localities play havoc by beating and flailing the trees this sand beats off the bark on the trees stormward quarter exposing their very bones often it eats its way into the already half flayed trunks the stormward half of many trees is dead and lifeless a sand graven totem pole while the living half holds long tattered limbs streaming leeward this gale-blown sand frequently prevents trees from growing higher than the shelter behind which they stand in places so-called trees may be seen with trunks one to three feet in diameter and only one or two feet high cut off by the sand fire of the high winds numerous long limbs reach out from the trunk in all directions the shoots which these limbs send up are clipped off by the wind shot sand in time this treetop is a table or brush of bristles twenty feet across and trimmed off as level as a lawn hundreds of these trees are often crowded together until the identity of each is lost forming acres of clipped low tree lawn the wide spreading mass is too low to crawl under and not quite strong enough to allow one to walk on the surface it is a good mattress to sleep on often i have rolled out of one of these treetop beds without discovering the tumble till morning snowslides landslides and other factors often pile up embankments of debris and these form large windbreaks whose shelter allows trees to grow in places formerly wind-swept and inhospitable trees at timberline are eternally vigilant and promptly seize every new opportunity or opening one spring a landslide on the slope of mount clarence king piled a shipload of stones on a wind-swept treeless flat a few years later several dozen spruce were growing up in the leeward of this chance made shelter but slides or other forces occasionally remove shelters behind which a forest front was formed or they place an obstruction which changes the course of the prevailing winds snow slides occasionally cut an avenue down into a forest which exposes the trees on the edges of the new avenue or an old stretch of forest front is sheared off by a slide with the hardened front ranks removed the less hardy trees thus exposed are slashed and shot to pieces by the cutting edges of the prevailing gales one day i came out upon a long hedge-like growth of trees extending down the slope here the high sand flinging winds blew from the west to the east a lone boulder 
about six feet in diameter at the west end of the hedge had sheltered the first tree that had grown up to the leeward of it then another tree had risen in the shelter of this one and still others in order and in line eastward until the long hedge was grown the straight line of the hedge from west to east showed that the high winds were always from the same quarter and the topography of the place had compelled them to rush along the straight line which they had followed the front of this hedge was the diameter of the boulder and the further end about two hundred feet away was about a foot higher each summer thousands of shoots and twigs grew out on the top and sides but each succeeding winter the winds trimmed them off long afterward in pursuit of a woodchuck one day a grizzly dug out a few tons of earth and stones by the side of this boulder frost and water undermined until gravity caused the boulder to roll over the hedgerow was quickly sandblasted to pieces and in a few years all that remained was a number of stubby trunks half round with the flattened stormward side fantastically ground and engraved by the wind and sand i have followed the timber line for hundreds of miles in the sierras the cascades and the rocky mountains one evening i camped on the rim of wild basin in what is now the rocky mountain national park out of the opposite side of the basin long's peak swept ruggedly far up into the sky i was on the eastern slope of the continental divide great light bars miles in length and long shadow pennants of peaks lay across the basin as the sun descended these lengthened and pushed down the descending slopes finally they reached out upon the great plains nearly a hundred miles distant nearby a solitaire sang with inspiring and unrivalled eloquence he sang from a crag and from a treetop and then with intense ecstasy while darting and dropping wheeling and gliding he gladdened the air above his nesting mate once he rose high above the shadows and for a moment poured forth his song in the bright sunlight above as he ceased the beavers began making merry in a pond just below i watched them and the purple ripples they made presently the ripples faded from sight but in the darkness the easy movements and dividing wavelets of the swimmers were revealed by the rocking of the reflected stars in the night a white crowned sparrow repeatedly sang briefly a camp bird quietly waited for my awakening later a tiny chipmunk bashfully called an astonished squirrel first stared in silence then with a jerky note scolded and bluffed from a safety first distance but at last gave way to curiosity and came closer big game is common along the boundary of woodland and grassland deer and elk frequent timberline during the summer and mountain sheep may be seen at any time in the autumn it is frequented by bears the mountain lion coyote and fox come to this edge of the woods to watch and wait and here concealed gaze out upon the upland open beautiful lakes gouged by glaciers out of solid rock are scattered along the furthest edge of the forest they are one of the distinctive charms of these arctic gardens with a border of wild cliff a waterfall a fringe of brilliant flowers grassy spaces picturesque trees in clusters and singly these lakes are wildly poetically lovely on the whole the heights are becoming drier many summits are no longer tolerant to the trees parts of the rocky mountains are in the arid belt and their winters are often extremely dry dry high winds 
frequently sweep their summits sucking moisture from all vegetation the unprotected trees in the forest front of dry ridges suffer greatly thousands perishing during a single dry winter i walked for hours along a dry summit slope strewn with the bleaching bones of millions of veteran pines and spruces here over a long front the battle had gone against the forest the nearest frontier was half a mile down the slope timberline is not fixed in places it is creeping forward and upward in other reaches it is being driven back still other boundary lines like those of nations are stationary for years then suddenly these are obliterated and redrawn as territory is lost or won only a few of the earth's numerous tree people dwell at timberline those most commonly found both at timberline in the heights and low levels of the north are pine spruce fir aspen birch and willow on the eastern slope of long's peak timberline is approximately two miles above sea level here in a moist place by a tiny tributary of the mississippi grow engelmann spruce alpine fir black birch aspen and arctic willow on a nearby dry slope all the trees are limber pines on mount orizaba close to the equator timberline is maintained above the altitude of thirteen thousand feet in the rockies of colorado and in the sierras it is at approximately eleven thousand five hundred feet the highest timberline of normal trees in the united states that i have found is on a gulch of the san juan mountains at an altitude of twelve thousand three hundred feet here are upright trees more than a foot in diameter and sixty feet high timberline in switzerland is about six thousand five hundred feet on mount washington about five thousand on mount rainier about seven thousand in most localities it is higher on the southerly mountain slopes than on the northerly in the far north the altitudinal and latitudinal timberlines converge and form the defensive outpost of the forest on the edge of the polar world broken wildflower gardens crowd and color every ragged opening among the picturesque tree groups on the forest frontier many of these flowers are dwarfed and tiny but in moist places they grow thickly and tall among the last trees i have seen wild sheep wading shoulder deep through wide meadows of colored bloom a typical timberline garden is a ragged edged acre fenced off and sheltered by a weird low wall of trees here and there a blooming open way connects it with an adjoining garden a young tree clump and a boulder pile add artistic touches here and there appear low-growing many tinted flocks tall stately columbines with silver and blue ribbons at the top blue mertinesia taller still paintbrushes touched with a variety of shades anemones gentians white monk's hood and bending upon its stem a ray-faced golden-brown gallilardia one winter the snow drifted deeply over a stretch of forest as large as a huge circus tent the following summer it partly melted the next winter new snow was added and the following spring the drift was larger than before it did not melt away until the third summer in the meantime the several hundred spruce trees were kept asleep in a natural cold storage and had failed to grow this is why their annual rings were two less in number than those of the neighboring trees of the same age trees have tongues they record in their annual rings the larger experiences of the years 
the triumphs of friendly seasons and the batterings and the burns that fall to the lot of those in the front ranks of high mountain forests a timberline veteran might tell of the wealth of moonlight on a winter night with forest outposts half buried in the white snow of crowded stars in the field of space of terrific winds and irresistible avalanches of vast snow piles with flying snow in perfect autumn days and during mist-filled nights i have slept and communed with my campfire at timberline timberline gives one the feeling of being on the edge of things envelop it in unevenly moving mist and everything seems a mystery the strangely shaped trees and the weird forms of tree clumps half revealed are a part of the indefinite the uncomprehended add to this vague realm the magic of a campfire and one loses the experience of ages and again is a primitive crouching fire worshipper in a new and unexplored world a campfire ever recalls the ages long past and paints primeval scenes through all the centuries the campfire has been a place of safety and comfort of hope and cheer though they stand in one place all their years trees have adventurous lives from their seedling days to battered old age and stored in their unrolled and untranslated annual rings are their records and perhaps glimpses of the ever-changing scenes in which they grew sometimes while watching my changing campfire blaze i have half believed that the blazing tree was picturing with fire the story of its life the larger experiences of the years the triumphs of the good seasons and the failures of the bad the battles with wind and frost with fire and insect foes surely no picture ever painted is more suggestive than the campfire with it the imagination brings the dead past back to life and its people in fitting scenes act again the parts they once played the big trees of california are the greatest living wonders of the world in the serene sierras they have achieved the dignity befitting the largest and the oldest living things upon this earth compared with these big trees the timberline trees of the rockies are pygmies and infants yet who shall say that the life story of the timberline tree is the less inspiring to stand beneath the big trees is to feel the silent eloquence of the noblest of a noble race to stand above the dwarfed and battered front ranks of the intrepid timberline forests where the storm king reigns and the eagle soars is to live with fired imagination through all the long years of battle and to feel the triumphs of the unconquerable timberline touches the heart with a sense of universal kinship end of chapter four chapter five of the adventures of a nature guide by enos mills this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five wind rapids on the heights terrific winter winds occasionally sweep through the high passes of the continental divide believing that their velocity was sometimes more than one hundred miles an hour i planned to go up and measure the velocity of the next wind that appeared to be exceeding the speed limit an air meter was placed in granite pass this was on the long's peak trail about one mile beyond the limits of tree growth and at an elevation of more than two miles above the level of the sea one february morning the rush and boom of the wind among the pines proclaimed that previous speed records were likely to be broken i left my cabin and started up to the meter 
which was about three thousand feet higher than my cabin and five miles from it in irregular succession the heavy waves of wind rolled down this slope into the forest a splendid and stormy sea roared through the treetops the first half mile was through a thicket growth of tall young pines these young and pliant trees were bending shaking and streaming in the wind i turned aside from the trail to see the behavior of the tallest woods a dense growth of engelmann spruce at the bottom of the steep slope of battle mountain i climbed into a treetop one hundred feet high around me the tall and crowded trees were swaying and bowing through a dignified dance invisible wind breakers produced sudden dips and vigorous sweeps that my old tree thought he enjoyed occasionally the treetop swayed in one direction then bowed in another once he nodded in succession toward all points of the compass tracing a wavy circle perhaps twenty feet in diameter then he straightened up again to the perpendicular the entire forest was suddenly tilted forward by a violent wind wave and without the least warning i was clinging to a leaning tower engelmann spruce wood is not celebrated for toughness so i quickly descended to earth in the shelter of the storm battered trees at timberline i looked out into the yellow sand filled air upon a treeless arctic moorland the gale tore among the trees with ever varying intensity sand and gravel pattered and rattled against the scarred and veteran pines i climbed a low stocky tree which the hardest wind wave struck this tree was so rigid that it quivered and oscillated like a building in an earthquake at the altitude of eleven thousand five hundred feet i emerged from the woods and faced the gale it assailed me with a sand blast that bruised my hands and brought blood from my face and speedily drove me back into the woods again i tried this time i crawled forward between low heathy growths at the start these afforded a little protection but as i advanced the wind swept through more swiftly and violently i was glad to crawl out into the open moorland here after an advance of a few hundred yards i paused to rest in the lee of a butte of granite thicker than hail the sand and gravel rained down upon me a roll of my coat caught a handful much of this consisted of sand bits the size of a pencil point but there were a few pieces of gravel the size of hazelnuts the remainder was rock dust crushed by colliding with the cliff it was a warm dry chinook wind its temperature was several degrees above the freezing point there had been but little snow and only a few small icy drifts lay scattered upon the brown bare moor the sun shone in a cloudless sky but the air was so filled with rock dust that objects more than one hundred feet away were out of focus in the hazy yellow air the effect was that of a desert sandstorm the wind however was of greater velocity and carried less dust than in desert storms leaving the shelter of the cliff i again advanced by crawling a brief stop was made behind a rock point about five feet high here the wind poured down upon me with such force that it could not be endured thus far above the limits of the trees not a living thing had showed itself but in crawling along the edge of an icy snowdrift i came upon a number of ptarmigan many were sitting in little nests just the size of their bodies which they had made in the hard snow a few were bravely feeding squatting low 
they grabbed at weed seeds and other edible objects that came sifting down over the snow though in a sheltered place one of them was occasionally bowled over by the wind on regaining its feet it struggled back into its nest but not one risked opening its wings apparently they considered me as harmless as a mountain sheep with curious eyes they allowed me to crawl by within three feet the wind met me with violent dashes with moderate movements and with occasional intervals that were almost calm in many of its rushes the wind rolled forward like a stormy breaker with invisible unbroken wave front in a sustained roar at other times this great wave was broken into wild maelstroms terrific spirals of various diameters and tilted at every angle sometimes a wave went forward with long bouncing leaps bounding entirely clear of the earth for long distances then striking heavily to roll and break like a breaker on the beach occasionally over a small space there was an explosive effect that sent dust and gravel flying with slouch hat and mittened hands i protected my face as best i could a few times a violent narrow whirlwind cut unrestrained into unrelated air currents like the explosion of a cannon and by sheer speed and force it smashed its way diagonally across and through other rushing winds most of the time i crawled but occasionally during a calm i rose up and ran forward a few hundred feet except during lulls it was perilous to stand erect these winds could not be withstood by bracing main strength did not answer rarely did they strike straight forward they struck on every side seldom was i blown over but i was kicked into the air and i was sometimes knocked down or hurled to one side at last i gained the air meter it was up at twelve thousand feet and stood where the wind simply pounded through the pass the meter cups were making a blurred wheel of speed a few times they showed the wind at one hundred and seventy miles an hour around me were high peaks and deep canyons level plateaus and crag torn slopes these intercepted and deflected the wind waves and currents against these obstructions the powerful invisible wind hurled itself more uproariously than storm stirred sea against defying and moveless shore ever from some quarter came an unending roar splendid were the deep sounds and thunderings ponderously heavy and prolonged were the booms of the wind these often mingled with terrific crashing explosions which even the elastic air did not always soften there were long ripping sounds as the diverted wind rolled up a slope or tore around a corner then strange were the seconds of ominous almost breathless calm after reading the meter i went higher carried away with the wild elemental eloquence of the storm i concluded to get effects from the high ledges and finally from the summit of long's peak every step advanced every new height somehow gained was a fight it took all my endurance and it stimulated utmost alertness i simply crawled forward and upward and i wrestled with an invisible unresting contestant who occasionally tried to hurl me over a ledge or smash my bones against the rocks for a mile i made my way across a moraine with the wind beating against my right side the scattered boulders made traveling difficult many were large and had to be climbed over 
such activities often gave the wind the eagerly used opportunity of shooting me with icy pellets and of knocking me off my feet at the altitude of thirteen thousand feet the trail was through a rocky opening called keyhole here the wind rushed in an invisible but irresistible flood to go against it was sheer madness so i climbed down and around keyhole while doing this as i lay flat on my face i was caught by a rush of wind it lifted me a foot or two then jammed me back after repeating this it pitched me headlong the wind swept out of the west and came in contact with the divide at right angles on the east the wind blew everywhere but strangely enough on the western side it struck the mountains from eleven thousand feet upward below this was perfect calm by watching the whirling snow and other wind-blown materials i judged this wind current to be about two thousand feet thick above approximately thirteen thousand feet was an air current moving in nearly the opposite direction in crossing the divide this wind that was blowing high above the earth on the west side closely raked the earth on the eastern side from points near the top of the peak i looked out over my home to the east two thousand feet above it the air was comparatively free from dust to the east i saw a number of birds flying high and plainly in a calm stratum of air as i continued upward above thirteen thousand feet the wind gushed and stormed through the narrow openings between pinnacles and around the large rocks in debris piles i crawled through a number of these openings there are rapids in rivers and rapids in air streams running a river rapid in a boat is exhilarating crawling through a wind rapid is even more intense it lacks most of the exhilaration that goes with the river rapid but exhilaration is not wholly absent in bays and channels of the sea the restless waters wildly eddy powerful invisible undertows and whirlpools are present where wild defiant winds are diverted rock projections behind which i hoped to find shelter were more unfriendly places than the open the wind appeared to round them with increased speed and to batter the leeward more furiously than the stormward front around a number of rocky projections the wind revolved with swirling rapidity it hurled me off with centrifugal motion each time i made close approach once i blundered by breaking into one of these whirls and was roughly handled while in and while getting out of it each time that i hugged the earth more closely than usual the wind took a sheer delight in paying me personal attentions while many of these calls were with evil intentions the others were but the investigations of the curious i was grabbed and then slammed back i was trampled upon and several times was recklessly dragged over rough stones i was occasionally raised gently upward then laid gently down rolled slowly over then turned slowly back once i was picked carefully up by a current that carried me off as carefully as if to first aid but from this i was rudely snatched by an angry wind whose every effort was to put me in need of this aid the most difficult and dangerous place was at a point at an altitude of about fourteen thousand feet this was where a long narrow gulch and a fan-like slope converged and ended on the summit of a narrow ridge beyond which there was a narrow ledge bounded by an unbanistered space sweeping upward three thousand feet from the bottom of a canyon came the wind 
through converging channels that ended in this one narrow gorge my struggles were intense in the last few feet of this channel the gorge in which i climbed was extremely steep yet so powerful was the wind current that all my strength was required to prevent being torn loose shot upward and thrown over the precipice icy fragments torn from the walls twigs from a mile below went hurtling and rattling by and shot far out over the precipice had i let go for even a second i should have followed them not for an instant did the wind stop it had the constant rush of rapids i eased myself upward in the rushing wind crawling close holding with hands and anchoring and holding rear down by hooking feet behind and beneath rocks trail conditions were favorable and these together with my climbing experiences endurance and knowledge of the place were of advantage to me all these were needed just before reaching the top of the narrow ridge and the precipice i felt the wind getting the better of me and feared that a slightly more violent rush or surge would tear my holds loose so i concluded to reverse ends putting a shoulder against a rock point i allowed the wind to push my legs around then forward i was then going up feet foremost instead of head foremost the gully was so extremely steep that i was almost standing or walking on my head this reverse of ends enabled me to brace effectively with my feet and also to hang on more securely with my hands little by little i eased myself upward there was no climbing the wind sucked dragged pushed and floated me ever upward at last i safely crossed the ridge rounded a point and sat down for a long rest on the famous narrows of the longs peak trail the narrows is a ledge with a precipice in front and a wall behind this wall rises precipitously to the summit the precipice makes a wild steep descent of two thousand feet it is none too wide for a thoroughfare that has unbanistered space before it fortunately it was sheltered from the wind otherwise traversing it would not have been either safe or sane why did i in this perilous gale in this wild wind venture precipices and go up into the sky on a peak nearly three miles above the seven restless seas irresistible is nature's call to play this call comes in a thousand alluring forms it comes at unexpected times and sends us to unheard of places we simply cannot tell what nature will have of us or where next but from near and far ever calls her eloquent voice in work and in dreams she shows a thousand ways suggests the presence of wonderlands yet unseen she pictures alluring scenes in which to rest and play in mysterious ways she sends us eagerly forth for unscaled heights and fairylands of these she whispers or of them she sounds her bugle song she fascinatingly commands and charms us to other scenes we rush to respond and fix our eyes on a happy horizon toward which we hurry but ere we reach it she calls elsewhere and elsewhere with highest hopes of a boy at play we hasten it was seriously splendid to play with these wild winds there is no greater joy than wrestling naked-handed with the elements my most uncertain work was a little below the summit the ridge that had shielded my crawling came to an end i was on the edge of a steep short slope that ended at the top 
but this slope was smooth and icy and at the bottom paid tribute to a precipice it was too slippery to climb across it swept the deflected wind current on the opposite side the current struck a ridge and with diminished force shot upward to the summit apparently this wind rushed as steadily as a mountain river it was swift enough to sweep me across but if it hesitated after i cast my lot in it down the toboggan slope i would slide eagerly i pushed myself out into it and let go across it rushed me sprawling bumping me into the rocky ridge beyond here the interrupted current lifted me upward i had little else to do than guide myself rapidly it boosted to the top standing on the edge of the summit i turned for a moment to look back down this icy slope which later i must somehow retrace the summit of long's peak is fourteen thousand two hundred and fifty five feet above the sea and about four hundred feet in diameter it is comparatively level though not smooth granite stones and slabs of various sizes cover the top in terrific weighty rushes the wind splendidly thundered against the west wall of the summit all this time the wind was continually roaring round lower pinnacles and terrifically booming against the lower obstructions the old peak met these cyclonic rushes with strange impassiveness without a tremble deflected by the west wall the current shot upward for a hundred feet or so the top of the peak was thus left in comparative calm i ventured too close to the west edge and my hat was torn off it started skyward like a rocket but less than one hundred feet above the peak it fell out of the uprush and into the large slowly rotating eddy that covered the space over the top slowly around in a large air whirlpool the hat was carried i threw a number of stones trying to bring it back to earth presently the forward current caught it then like a duck in a wind the hat shot forward pointing straight at a lower and nearby lighting place a flock of rosy finches were feeding off the stuff that sifted down out of the wind as i watched them they were unmindful of the wind and had thought of no danger but behind a nearby stone a beady-eyed weasel watched and waited far down the range to the south quantities of snow were being explosively hurled into the air this showed that there had been a recent snowfall and also that the wind had just reached that scene the scattered snow was thrown high in the air into spirals and whirls and then seized and carried flying to the leeward this powdered snow trimmed the peak points with steamy whirls and gauzy banners and silky pennants through which the sunlight played northward for one hundred miles the gale was sweeping eastward and a stratum of dust hid the wyoming plains the sky above was clear and strangely blue the sun shone brightly my shadow against a granite monolith stood out as if of a dark and sculpted figure cut from stone end of chapter five Chapter Six of the Adventures of a Nature Guide by Enos Mills. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The woods were made for the hunters of dreams, the brooks for the fishers of song. To the hunters who hunt for the gunless game, the streams and the woods belong. There are thoughts that moan from the soul of a pine and thoughts in the flower bell curled and the thoughts that are blown with the scent of the fern are as new and as old 
as the world sam walter foss chapter six the arctic zone of high mountains the peaks and plateaus of high mountains are distinguished by a climatic zone that is somewhat similar to that of arctic regions many species of plants and birds of polar zones are found in the broken summit lands of the rocky mountains the sierra and other high lifted mountains the alps the summit slopes of the himalayas and other asiatic mountains those of mexico and the andes all carry their own characteristic arctic gardens mount washington and a few of the peaks of new england and new york and numbers of the peaks in national parks carry luxuriant wild arctic gardens on their high-held heads and shoulders on mount rainier between the timberline and the snow line there is perhaps the greatest wild garden in the world a great brilliantly colored wreath a mile wide and fifty miles in circumference encircles the peak touched here and there with glaciers on mount mckinley between three thousand and seven thousand feet above the sea is another splendid and magnificent garden filled with wild flowers and wild life in the colorado rockies the arctic outpost that lies above the timberline embraces about five million acres it has more than one thousand peaks these sky-held island-like areas more than two miles above the sea are less known than islands of the south sea they carry lakes canyons tundras moorlands snowfields and many a lichen tinted cliff and rock slide this mountain plateau region of the rockies which lies between the peak summits and the timberline is a world by itself it has its storms and its moving wreaths and strata of clouds and also its full share of sunshine it carries rare scenery and its countless outlying rims and edges where the plateaus of the sky break off and steeply descend into lakes canyons and mountain valleys are seen commanding viewpoints these are close to the stars show the forests and streams the lights and shadows below and the sunset clouds on the nearby horizons of the sky brilliant wild flowers enrich the treeless prairies and the grassy sedgy meadows many are dwarfed to tiny smallness but others grow with even greater than lowland vigor their colors are varied and brilliant and many are perfumed in these skylands numerous birds nest and sing here bears and woodchucks roam grasshoppers leap and fan their wings and butterflies float in painted glory it is the home of the bighorn and the coney the ptarmigan and the rosy finch too enjoy this realm throughout the year but the summer visitors are also happy deer elk coyotes southland birds and eagles all make merry on its peaks and moorlands so too do the flocks of birds of many species from lowlands and far north who briefly visit it during the early autumn for picnic feasts while journeying toward winter homes somewhere under the southern skies one of the strangest wildlife gatherings that i have ever seen was in the arctic alpine zone of a mountain plateau twelve thousand feet above the sea if you wish to have an experience entirely new to see wild birds and wild animals in a happy commingling in the mountains to witness a boisterous wildlife feast and fair then visit the realm just above the timberline in the rocky mountains when the birds are flying south no food station along the way of migrating birds can show a more motley or spectacular gathering than an autumnal one on these heights it is often made up of flocks of migrating birds representing numerous species 
they come from alaska from the barren lands the mountains of british columbia and the birch margined streams of the north woods they are bound for winter homes and picnic lands in texas mexico cuba orinoco and argentina in addition to migrating birds there are resident birds and visitors from down the mountain slopes birds from the southland that have summered in the heights and birds that have come up from near but lower territory for this autumnal feast they gather from near and far like folks at a fair each spring most birds move northward a few hundred or a few thousand miles most of them nest and summer in the scenes which their ancestors selected as soon as the children are ready to travel they start for the southland as a rule they travel by easy stages though a number of species travel rapidly but all must have food along the way and in the healthy places of the heights close to the eternal snowflakes in the arctic moorlands of the rocky mountains two miles above the level of the sea many birds pause and celebrate with this celebration they close summer begin autumn and anticipate the winter the setting for this festival is one of strange beauty and wild magnificence the forest frontier with its scattering of dwarfed and storm-battered trees curtains this stage from the world below storied old snow piles are a part of the scenery so too the high near peaks the enormous moraines the clear brooks glad and wild with energy vigorously beginning a thousand mile journey to the sea crags stand in healthy meadows and huge scattered boulders are near the low-growing arctic willows leaves in the forest edge are taking on autumn color and in the open spaces the mountainside is bright with late flowers in these moorlands are scattered the last and best of nature's crop of choice berries kinnikinick currant wintergreen blueberry and bunchberry in the lowlands the berries have been gone for days and even weeks one feels that nature is taking unusual liberties in the plant world that summer has added a postscript to her season and has climbed the mountain tops for the benefit of her feathered and furred creatures arctic plants are scattering their seeds to the winds the succulent leaves of many of the plants which further down the mountain slope or in the valley have long since made plans for winter are here in season and hanging on in all their early summer beauty with the last of summer with its flowers berries and seeds are grasshoppers and numerous accompanying varieties of insects that live upon the small plant growth